So this is an example of acryl skin, skin on the palm or sole. And you can tell that because it's got a very thick uh, corneal layer here at the top. And it's got that stratum lucidum that we talked about previously. And the reason I'm showing this, this is actually not normal skin, this is skin that's involved by contact dermatitis like you get if you touch poison ivy. And there's uh, some extra white space up in the surface here that's making a little blister. And there's some of this stuff that's called perikeratosis. We can go closer and look. See, normally you don't have nuclei left in the corneal layer, but when skin gets irritated and starts growing quickly, the nuclei get retained. We talked a little bit about that earlier. The granular layer kind of goes away or gets diminished. And then per uh, perikeratosis, the presence of nuclei in the corneal layer, um, uh, shows up. And so that's a sign that the skin's abnormal. That's not a normal finding to have perikeratosis. It means the skin's been irritated from a dermatitis or a rash, or it's a tumor, um, a precancerous growth, something like that. All right. And then here in the dermis, um, you can see that around the vessels, see here's a little blood vessel right here, a little thin one, but around that there are all these blue cells. Those blue cells are lymphocytes and maybe some histiocytes also, macrophages if you like. Um, the reason I show these is that, that even though these, uh, when we have a lot of them, is kind of an abnormal finding, almost all skin that we see uh, biopsied has at least some degree of lymphocytes around the vessel. So a little bit of lymphocytes is actually normal and is not, not anything to get too worked up about. So when you see these blue cells around vessels, they're probably just lymphocytes. Don't, don't be uh, too concerned. And uh, they're also the other reason I was showing this. Ah, here. Let's see, we'll go at higher power and see if we can see them better. These bright little guys here, it's really hard to pick them up because their granules don't show up, but they're bright orange. They're like brighter than, those are red blood cells. These are these bright orange cells. These are um, eosinophils and they have two lobes of their nuclei. It looks like a little pair of like aviator sunglasses or something. And uh, then they have these bright orange granules. And so eosinophils are involved in a variety of processes, including allergic processes. So in this case, this is allergic contact dermatitis. That's why they're here. And also they're involved in, in fighting off parasites and other things like that. And then you, you sometimes we talk about neutrophils. So in contrast, these dark guys that are almost purple or black in color, those are lymphocytes. See that guy there that has multiple nuclei? That's actually a um, neutrophil. And he's just there in a, in a blood vessel. That's normal. When you see a lot of them, that usually means... Uh, something else. All right, so the reason I wanted to show this slide is that when you go over here, there's this space, and looking next to the space, you can see there's a lot of extra white space between each of the keratinocytes in the epidermis. And this is called edema, or when, it, when edema is present in the, in the epidermis, it's called spongiosis. And so spongiotic dermatitis is things like eczema or eczematous dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, contact dermatitis. There's a large number of different um, uh, rashes that give you this, uh, this finding microscopically. The reason that I'm showing you in a normal histology video is that when you look at this on higher power, what you can see, it's hard to get in focus, but between each keratinocyte, see those little lines? Those are the spines. That's why we call this the spinous layer, because those spines, those are desmosomes, and you can see them much more clearly when they're stretched out by all that edema fluid in between um, each individual cell. So that, that space there is because of all the fluid that's pushing them apart, but it lets you really see how prominent those spines are. They're usually kind of difficult to see on normal skin, but here, when you have spongiosis, it's a nice uh, way to showcase just how dramatic those spines are. And and they're really strong because even though they're being pulled apart by all this fluid, they're holding on for dear life to their neighbor. And sometimes they, when they get pulled too hard, they lose connection. And that's when you get this little blister here. That's when, when you get these little bumps. And then those little cells inside there, these are Langerhans cells. And so we talked about Langerhans cells living in the um, mid, mid part of the epidermis. And the reason they live there is that because when you get contact with it, uh, or when you touch an antigen, those cells go and, and find that antigen and eat some of it and then take it back to the lymph node and um, show it to the immune system to see if you should mount an immune response. So these little guys here, those are Langerhans cells and they're kind of collecting together and, and in contact dermatitis, you get that. Again, look at those beautiful spines there. It's really, really very nice example. And oh look, that's a mitosis too while we're, while we're here. See that is a little uh, mitosis that's probably an anaphase. It's on its way to becoming two new daughter cells. So the skin is revved up and, and irritated. And so it's dividing and making new cells to try to repair itself. All right, so those are the spinous, the spinous processes. Now let's look at some more acryl skin. And this is normal acryl skin. We'll look from low power. 
And again, look, the really massively thickened uh, corneal layer, you can see this pale line here, that's the stratum lucidum. Again, the only place that's really present in the body normally is acral skin on the palms and soles. And you also get it if you scratch or rub your skin. And even from this power, we're, this is magnified 20 times normal, so um, uh, 20 times a normal uh, view. And you can see those open spaces are blood vessels. Here, up here you have your epidermis, you have your papillary dermis, the little pink stuff in between. This is the reticular dermis down here. And even from here you can see the difference in the collagen, the fine collagen of the papillary dermis, and then the thick chunky collagen, the thick bundles of collagen in the reticular dermis. And you can see down here that there at the bottom we're starting to get into the fatty layer, the subcutis, right? And then here between the dermis and the subcutis, we have all these little round structures. Those are all the eccrine glands that we talked about before that live at the, the level of the dermal subcutaneous junction. So even from very low power, you can begin to see all the structures once you know what you're looking for. So let's go in a little closer because there are a couple of unique structures in acral skin that are worth knowing about. I really like acral skin. It's very pretty under the microscope and it has a lot of cool little, uh, little things to see. So let's look number one, if we can find the structures up here that I really like, and of course they probably won't be here now that I'm looking for them. Hmm, that's disappointing. Well, we'll have to go down here instead. So this structure right here, look, it looks like a blood vessel. It's got kind of a little muscular pink wall, and in the middle it's got a space that's called the lumen, and that lumen is lined by a single layer of little kind of flattened cells. Those are endothelial cells, and there's a little couple red blood cells in the middle. But look, this is kind of different from other blood vessels because look, it's got these small round cells very nicely and neatly organized around the outside of this vessel. So this is called a glomus apparatus or glomus body, and these mostly exist at the tips of the fingers near the nail beds, and they, they are arteriovenous anastomosis, and the theory is that they play some role in temperature regulation um, and those little cells around them are called they're kind of modified smooth muscle cells pericytes we talked about earlier they're just very prominent here and they they kind of have contractile properties that allow this vessel to kind of open and close and allow blood blood through so that's a, a glomus apparatus and then look over here there's another little tubular shape but this is not a vessel it's got two layers of cuboidal cells so this is actually an eccrine duct all right so you can begin to tell these things apart once you look at them a lot uh, the other thing we'll look at here, we have uh, this structure, which is a pink bundle. And remember we talked about pink bundles can be nerve, smooth muscle, or uh, dense regular connective tissue like you'd see in the tendon or fascia. Um, and this, in this case, it's nerve. And nerve is kind of a little bit wavy. It kind of undulates back and forth. And when you look closer, you can see right there, this little line in the middle, that's actually an axon, and those little bubbles around it are where the myelin normally resides. Let's see if we can get that into better focus. So we're only seeing it just very focally. So that little pink line there is the axon. That little, that little space of white is where, where myelin was that's now washed out. So only in like kind of larger, deeper nerves do you really see much myelin. Up, up near the surface of the skin, we don't usually see myelinated nerves. We only see um, uh, unmyelinated most of the time microscopically. All right, and then let's look at the adipocytes while well, we have them here. So this is what the, the fat looks like in the subcutis. So the fat cells are large and white, large white circles, and they have nuclei. You just don't get to see them all the time because it depends what cut you're at. Each of these big, huge fat cells only has one nucleus. So the nuclei are these little, these little dark guys at the very edge of the fat cell. And they're actually kind of disc shaped, but they look like little spindled, stretched out cells because they're squished out by all this fat. And so it's kind of hard to see what their nuclei look like in a normal fat. But when you, um, when you, have, uh, when you get them cut at an angle, you can kind of see their, their nuclear features more. They have a little bubble of a little fat droplet in their nucleus. And we'll see if we can find that here. I don't, um, oh, there it is. So here, this, this little uh, uh, adipocyte nucleus is kind of folded over so we can see it, we can see it cut across. And that little, uh, that little hole in the center is, um, is called a locurn. That means nuclear lake. It's a little, little lake of fat in the middle of the nucleus. And uh, it's always there in adipocyte nuclei. You just can't usually see it. So when the fat gets kind of atrophic or damaged, you can kind of see it. it we cut the, through the adipocyte nucleus at an angle. And then you can see this little bubble. It's always there, but people sometimes get confused about that because they're not used to seeing it. And uh, there's another little tiny glomus apparatus. See the little vessel in the middle and then the little glomus cells around it.